You know, I've thought many times, Chris, as, as you've just asked, is uh, what is the takeaway? And the takeaway is that we all need heroes. We all need examples. We all need to see how it is done the very best by the very best and for the very best reasons. To be a citizen and to be a Columbia resident and to be an American is the highest honor anybody could have. And to recognize constantly, daily, how we have to rededicate ourselves to the effort and the tasks that are necessary to maintain and retain our country, our freedom, and our citizenship. And to see somebody that sacrificed so much for so long, who is still alive and still promoting it unabashedly, and enthusiastically, and to show the positive results of those efforts is inspiring to me, and it rededicates me to go out tomorrow and do the very best I can for our country and for God. From as far back as John Clark can remember, he wanted to fly airplanes. The Columbia native and 1957 Hickman High School graduate never really thought about anything else for a career. And so the young engineering student entered the University of Missouri's Air Force ROTC program and eventually became its Cadet Corps commander, leading over 2,000 fellow cadets. After graduation, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Air Force and soon entered pilot training at Reese Air Force Base in Texas in 1962. After his first tour of duty flying medical evacuation aircraft out of McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, Clark traveled to Alconbury Air Base in England where he joined the 1st Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron. This assignment determined what Clark would be doing in the Vietnam conflict, not dogfighting in a jet fighter, but reconnaissance. In 1964, the United States Air Force introduced a reconnaissance version of their already high-performing F-4 fighter jet. The magnificent state-of-the-art jet in different configurations could now perform two equally important tasks, fight in the sky and spy on the enemy. We're at Missouri's Whiteman Air Force Base, and I'm standing next to the fighter version of the McDonald Aircraft F-4 Phantom II. The reconnaissance version of this jet, the RF-4C, is what Captain John Clark piloted. The new warplane was a beast that could fly 1,300 miles per hour at any altitude between 100 feet and 57,000 feet. It was a two-seat, twin-engine, all-weather, long-range, supersonic feat of engineering. The RF-4C took photos at both high and low altitude, day or night. It carried no offensive armament, and it didn't fly a company. As the Air Force recon community of pilots like to say, they flew alone, unarmed, and unafraid. Clark had already flown 60 reconnaissance missions over Vietnam prior to the morning of March 12, 1967. It was supposed to be a run-of-the-mill weather reconnaissance mission to see what the fighter jets would need to know for their missions later that day. Clark describes the scene in his book, The Eagle Hunts. He and the other pilot, Captain Ed Goodrich, fly in front seat. We're flying at just over 100 feet altitude and at 600 miles per hour, when orange balls of light suddenly started flashing all around. Anti-aircraft fire. There was a sudden thud in the plane's belly and the Phantom began to roll, then tumble end over end. The plane, out of control, was hurling forward and falling back to earth. There was a mountain ridge up ahead and Clark calculated at 600 miles per hour it was only four seconds away, about the same amount of time he needed to eject. With G-forces pinning his arms down, he was still able to pull the ejection handle between his knees. He was shot into the sky with a force of a 40 millimeter cannon, and when the main chute deployed, he saw a huge ball of fire on the ridge, a ball of fire that four seconds prior was his Phantom II. We knew it was 37 millimeter dead on target. Um, pulled up to get out of this dream of anti-aircraft fire from the ground and, and as we pulled up, took a thump in the belly. It was just bump and I thought we're hit but the airplane looks like it's still flying so hey, maybe we'll make it home. Uh, so about that time, everything 
just went crazy. I mean, uh, I, I have no idea what happened to that airplane. I didn't know it was upside down. I didn't know what was spinning around one way or the other way. I didn't know where the tail had come off. I, and, and I knew, hey, this airplane is not flying. This airplane is just hurling like a rock. Now, and it's going down. And there's that ridge over there. We're flying 600 miles an hour. We were about 100 feet over this ridge and I'll bet we've gone down at least 100 or 200 since we took a hit and it's doing this, whatever the heck it was. So I decided, man, I'm out of here. Well, I tried uh, to lift my hands to get a hold of the ejection handles over my head. And I couldn't do it because I couldn't raise my hands. The G-forces were so heavy that I just couldn't lift my hands. So the, the stick is right here. So I just dropped my hand and I said, I'll just slide it over there and see if I can get a hold of that handle that's been that's between my legs, which is the emergency ejection handle. So now that's what's going through my mind. I got to get a hold of that handle and I need to get out of this airplane. And about that time, I'm also thinking, you know, if this thing is flipping, then if it happens to be upside down, that seat is just going to shoot me right into the ground at, at 600 miles an hour. Uh, that's an immediate death option. Then I thought, but if it's maybe sideways up a little bit or up like that, or maybe straight up, I'm going to have a chance to get out of this thing. And then I decided I don't have any time to try to decide whether it's up or down or where it is because I haven't a clue. So I just went for the handle. And I got a hold of the handle with my right hand and uh, try, I, I pulled it, it snapped. Well, the seat didn't fire. It didn't fire. I thought, oh, man, this is not a good thing. And, and uh, then I remembered about what the technician told me during my seat training. John, this seat, this handle will take a quarter of a second to fire the seat. So with your mind being all whipped up and, and uh, mental compression being what it is, um, it's gonna seem like the feet, seat hasn't fired. So you just keep pulling and it'll fire. The next thing I knew, everything was gray. I mean, I was in the wind blast. And by that time, I couldn't care less whether I was going into the ground or not. I'd done it, I was committed, it was way beyond my control, and I was along for the ride. It was a hard landing with Clark still strapped into a survival pack and seat cushion. Vietnamese villagers and military personnel rushed toward him with shovels, hammers, as well as AK-47s and pistols. He was soon surrounded. The next morning, he was delivered to the old French prison, Hoa Lo, known to American servicemen as the Hanoi Hilton. The other pilot, Ed Goodridge, had also successfully ejected, but once on the ground, decided to shoot it out with the enemy and was killed in the exchange of gunfire. Clark was imprisoned for five years and 11 months. Presumed dead, his family didn't know he was alive and a prisoner of war until they received Clark's first letter three years into his captivity. During those five years and 11 months, Clark was tortured or mistreated for propaganda or upon the slightest infraction of the camp regulations, as were the hundreds of other American prisoners. The torture devices included chains, whips, leg irons, solitary confinement, sleep deprivation, drugs, and threats of execution. And then there were the straps. Straps that bound arms behind the back in excruciatingly unnatural and painful positions. The prisoners survived by utilizing mental games, tap codes for communication and human connection, 
and prayer. He rose to the occasion during times when it was terrifying. He didn't know if he was alone. He could have been the only guy going through what he went through. He could die at any time. Uh, to me, that prospect was very, very uh, daunting. And uh, he, he shows me that I could probably deal with it if I'd had to. Yeah, when I think of John Clark and his military service, he and his fellow POWs are inspirations, certainly to this generation, my generation and those Americans today. But what I know is that his story will inspire generations and years to come. John Clark was released on February 18, 1973. He returned as an Air Force major and a hero to a very welcoming and grateful Columbia later that month. After some well-deserved rest, Clark obtained a master's degree in business administration. He resigned from his regular commission in 1977, but then served two years in the Air Force Reserves. And following that, he served in the Missouri Air National Guard as an emergency war plans officer. After several other assignments, Clark retired in 1992 as an Air Force Colonel. That was 10 years after he married his wife, Ann. She has been his partner and best friend ever since. This year, they are celebrating 41 years of marriage. Clark continued his life of service by becoming Columbia, Missouri's city water distribution engineer, where he was instrumental in preserving the city's McBain water treatment plant during the great flood of 1993. He retired from the city in 2000. He has used his retirement to travel the nation, making presentations on hope, faith, patriotism, and service. Colonel Clark's military decorations and awards include the Silver Star, two Legions of Merit, the Distinguished Flying Cross, two Purple Hearts, the Meritorious Service Medal, the Prisoner of War Medal, and two Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Crosses. Courage, faith, and patriotism. These words describe the very essence of this Boone County native and decorated hero. He served his country with distinction and like hundreds of other prisoners of war who were brought home, he returned with honor. Ladies, gentlemen, and esteemed friends, please welcome into the Boone County Hall of Fame, Colonel John W. Clark.